The Orioles got the win on Sunday and just continue to refuse to be swept this season. But even with that W, another series loss showed that this Orioles roster might have some holes and they might need some reinforcements here in the next couple of days. We'll talk about who that could be, both on the hitting and pitching side, coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. There, Orioles fans, today is Monday, June 19th, 2023, and welcome back into the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap an Orioles series loss to the Chicago Cubs. The O's drop two out of three in Chicago, but they do win the last game on Sunday. Get out of there with a win. Avoid the sweep. I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles W on Sunday, including a good bullpen performance, some clutch hitting earlier in the game, and Dean Kramer just not getting a lot of help from his defense in that one. Then we'll take a look at the rest of the weekend, the two Orioles lost, and specifically talk about how this O's roster could change. Because the Orioles have lost four out of their last seven series. They're still playing good baseball, but it's not the great baseball that they were playing earlier in the season. Who could come up from AAA to kind of give a spark here and make this team better? Talk about that on today's episode of the pod. But before we do so, just did want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms, and we're available right here on the Locked on Orioles YouTube channel. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed to Locked on Orioles on YouTube. Please continue to do so. We do a giveaway for every 1,000 subscribers that I get to, and for 3,000 subscribers, well, giving away the Cedric Mullins bobblehead. And as I promised all of last week, on today's episode, I would reveal the winner of the Cedric Mullins bobblehead. To enter, you had to subscribe to the pod on YouTube. And then put in the comments last week, the player from the Orioles rebuild, who is no longer on the team, but who means the most to you. I'm going to reveal the winner of the Mullins 30-30 bobblehead at the end of today's episode. So make sure to stick around for that. And thank you for being an everydayer if you are. And thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. For your first listen today, we're going to take a look at an Orioles series in Chicago. The O's, over the years, haven't played great at Wrigley Field. Now, they did win both games of a quick two-game series there last year in the midst of their 10-game winning streak that put them over 500. But in general, I mean, you think back to 2014. The Orioles won the AL East that year. It's the last time they did it. They got swept in a three-game series in Chicago that year. So it's not nearly indicative of how good or bad this team is going to be, but they've struggled at times there. And they struggled again this weekend, dropping two out of three in the series. They got pummeled on Friday afternoon, losing 10-3 to in game one. Then they had their chances in Saturday's game two to win it, but ultimately fell 3-2. to But luckily, the Orioles did avoid the sweep winning it 6-3 to three on Sunday to at least get one game in this three-game series at Wrigley Field. And with the victory on Sunday and overall losing two out of three in the series, the Orioles will head to Tampa Bay on Tuesday after the off day on Monday and the O's with a record after the loss on Sunday of 44-27. and 27. But I'm going to specifically get you the five things you need to know from the Sunday win. Because we'll talk about the things that went wrong this weekend and how it can be fixed later in the pod. I want to start by focusing on the positive. Orioles win at 6-3 to three on Sunday. Five things you need to know. And the first thing you need to know is, well, the Orioles avoided a sweep. And listen, they've been really good at that this year. Just recently on their last road trip, remember they lost those first two kind of ugly games to the Brewers and then came back late to win it to avoid the sweep. They've avoided a couple of sweeps this year, did it against the Rangers a couple weeks ago as well. And the Orioles, still 13 months in to Adley Rutschman's tenure as a Baltimore Oriole in the big leagues, the Orioles still have not been swept with Adley Rutschman on the roster. That is a pretty incredible stat, and it continues with the Orioles' win. And they did it once again like they've done so many times this season. Just when you think they're down and out, they provide you with a nice-looking comeback win and that's exactly what happened the Orioles get the big two runs in the fourth inning to put them on top they immediately lose the lead and then the three run sixth 
is the difference in this game. And it's the guys who lately have kind of just kept the offense turning along. Ryan O'Hearn, another big swing. He opened up the sixth inning with a single. He's just been, I mean, amazing. 17 of O'Hearn's last 21 batted balls have been hard hit balls. That is a ball off the bat with an exit velocity of 95 miles per hour or higher. That's kind of a ridiculous stat for O'Hearn, whose hard hit percentage is now near 60% in an Orioles uniform, which is just incredible. O'Hearn, over the weekend, did have a three-hit game on Friday, despite the loss, came off the bench to get a hit on Saturday. And then on Sunday, ho-hum, he was already four for six on the weekend, and O'Hearn, once again, two more hits, going six for 10 in this three-game series, now hitting 349 with a 1,003 OPS for the Orioles. He's just been amazing. He started things off. Then Aaron Hicks doubles into the Ivy in right field. Ramon Arias delivers a sack fly to tie the game at three, hitting the ball hard enough out to center field after the Orioles were thrown out at the plate in the first inning, trying to get a sack fly to get on the board. But then even at three to three, you know, the job had been done to at least tie the game, but the rally continued. Adam Frazier ends up with an RBI single to put him up 4-3. Ryan McKenna comes off the bench with a pinch hit single. Jorge Mateo with an RBI single. And all of a sudden, it's a 5-3 lead, and that was enough for the Orioles to hold on in this game. It's a big inning, a big rally later in the game. You just avoid that sweep. And if you're not getting swept, I've talked about it. If you are not getting swept and you're playing generally good baseball, you're going to find a way to get into the postseason more times than not. Second thing you need to know from this one on Sunday is that in general, the offense just kept the hits coming. Now, six runs in total, not an amazing number for the O's, but they did have 14 hits in this game. Austin Hayes, a three for four with a double. Adley Rutschman, a one for five, had an RBI double in the ninth inning to get a little cushion. Anthony Santander, a two for five, including a solo home run in the fourth inning to tie the game at one. Mentioned O'Hearn with a two for four. Aaron Hicks had a two for three with a double and a walk. Ramona Rios had a hit. Adam Frazier had a hit. Ryan McKenna off the bench had a hit. And Jorge Mateo had a hit in this game as well with his RBI single. Everybody contributing with 14 hits. And it's kind of similar to what the O's did on Saturday. I mean, they struggled with runners in scoring position, but they got base runners, just couldn't cash in. They did a much better job of cashing in with runners in scoring position on Sunday. And that led to this victory. And really, it was... Austin Hayes was the big name. I mentioned O'Hearn with the six hits. Austin Hayes had seven hits over the weekend. He's now up to a 320 batting average to lead the team among qualified players, though O'Hearn is at 349. But just nice to see the offense get it going after only five runs in the first two games of this series. Third thing you need to know from this one is that uh, the defense let the Orioles down in really their only bad inning of this Sunday game. That was the fourth inning. After the O's had scored two in the top of the fourth to take a 2-1 to -one lead, Cubs got two on the board in the bottom of the fourth off of Dean Kramer to retake the lead at 3-2. to two. And it was kind of all on the defense. Kramer retired the first two batters of the inning. He got ahead of Cody Bellinger, who popped the ball up into the Orioles' dugout. Josh Lester, who was getting the start at first base only because Gunnar Henderson was a late scratch from the lineup due to having a stomach flu. So Lester had to join the lineup and start at first base. He kind of wobbled his way over to first. He was tiptoeing while he was still like five or six feet away from the dugout railing. You know, because he was going over to his own dugout that the Orioles were probably yelling, you got room, you got room. You know, they were going to help him out if he even, you know, potentially started to flip into the dugout. But he just kind of looked scared that he was too close to the dugout, even though he wasn't even on the warning track yet. And the ball did land in the dugout. It's not like it landed in, in play, but it only landed about a foot into the dugout. And if he had gone to the railing, like Joe Girardi said on the broadcast, you got to get to the railing first and then leaned over and tracked the ball. I'm not going to say it's an easy catch, but he should have caught that ball and it should have been out number three. And what happens a couple of pitches later? Well, Bellinger laces one into the gap in right center field. Ryan O'Hearn starting in right field runs over there. It was a tough play. Don't get me wrong. It was a hard hit ball. It was hit on a line. It was hit into the gap. But O'Hearn got to it, and he just missed it. Ball goes right over his glove to the wall. They initially called it a triple. Later in the game, they ruled it in error. And then the very next batter, Christopher Morell, he's swinging a hot bat, just laces a two-run homer into left field. And instead of 2-1 O's heading to the fifth, it's 3-2 Cubs and still in the fourth. And it was a rough inning, and I get it. You know, Lester shouldn't really probably be on this team. O'Hearn is more of a first baseman than an outfielder. Gunnar Henderson getting scratched, changed some things up. 
but still got to make those plays. And, and that was a little bit of an ugly inning. Fourth thing you need to know from this one, speaking of Dean Kramer, I mean, besides that blemish, which again, he didn't have to give up the homer. He still could have picked his defense up and gotten the out, but it's tough to regroup after twice. You thought you had the third out of the inning and then you still have to go after another hitter. But besides that, and then the first pitch of the game in which Kramer literally on his first pitch allowed a solo home run to Mike Talkman that gave the Cubs a one nothing lead. He was really good other than that. I mean, he only got through five innings because he was working deep counts, so he threw 92 pitches. But in those five innings, the three runs he allowed, only one ended up being earned because that triple was turned into an error. He only allowed three hits. He struck out seven. He walked only two. And he allowed only three hard-hit balls on the day. It was, I believe, the Bellinger triple-turned error, the Talkman home run, and the Morell homer. That was it. And Kramer, most of the season, he's been able to get through five or six innings while kind of pitching around a lot of hard hit balls. That was not the case today. He only had nine whiffs, but eight came on the four seam fastball, which he was really working that four seamer up in the zone to get a lot of his seven strikeouts on the day. Again, went heavy cutter and sinker. They were in the strike zone. Curveball was a good kind of get me over pitch for Kramer on the day. Didn't really use the changeup or the sweeper much, but that was okay. It was enough to get through five solid innings for the Orioles. And then the fifth and final thing you need to know from the 06 to 3 one over the Cubs on Sunday is that the bullpen was just good. That's what they needed. They needed four innings out of the bullpen with a two-run lead, and that is what they got. Danny Coulomb with a really dominant one, two, three, sixth inning with a strikeout through only six pitches. Mike Bauman came into the seventh. He got two strikeouts, but he also hit two batters, struggled a little bit. So Yenye Cano had to come in. And Yenye Cano ended up getting four outs, got the final out of the seventh, gets all three outs in the eighth. And then Felix Bautista does what he does. One, two, three, ninth for his 19th save. Got a strikeout through just 10 pitches. And those are the guys that the O's are relying on in the bullpen right now. And I know Bauman struggled a little bit with the two hit batters, but he got two Ks as well. And the bullpen made it back-to-back -back scoreless days. On Saturday in that game, you had Danny Coulomb and Brian Baker pitch two scoreless innings to keep it at a 3-2 to two game after Kyle Gibson had a nice start. And then you had the bullpen throw four scoreless on Sunday. And that was good to see because the bullpen got roughed around in that 10-3 to three loss to the Cubs on Friday. And there were a lot of questions coming about the Orioles' middle relief. But a nice bounce back by the Orioles' bullpen on Saturday and then on Sunday as well to get the 6-3 to three win and avoid the sweep. But, you know, if you're going to lose a series, it's always nice, especially when you're you know leaving a town to get that final game, to hit the road before an off day on a positive note. But the Orioles still did lose this series, and that is not what you want to do, especially against a Cubs team that, I mean, came in struggling. Yeah, they get the series win, but this Cubs team still 33 and 38 on the season, playing in one of the worst divisions in baseball. And some things, especially the two losses this weekend, showed me that the Orioles may need some roster enforcements, and I know that a lot of people have been calling for a lot of changes to happen over the last few weeks, but this weekend specifically showed me that a couple of things might need to change, both in the bullpen and in the lineup. We'll talk about what those changes should be coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. And it's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage. And look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. So the Orioles do take down the Cubs 6-3 to on Sunday to avoid the sweep, but they did drop the series, losing 10-3 to Friday and 3-2 to on Saturday. And those two losses, coupled with some recent play by the Orioles. Now I know the O's had won, you know, six out of seven games. Coming into this series, they had won two out of three from the Jays. They had swept the Royals and also won the final game of that series in Milwaukee against the Brewers a couple weeks ago. But in general, they've now lost four out of their last seven series. That's nothing crazy. There are still 11 and 10 in their last 21 games. I mean, you're still playing over 500. And with the cushion they built themselves, especially in April, you know, they could play 500 ball the rest of the way. 
and they're probably getting in the postseason, right? I mean, if you play 500 baseball the rest of the way, when you are 44 and 27, let's say, you know, they have an odd amount of games left. So let's say you play one game above 500. If you end up 18 games above 500 by the end of the year, you're going to make the postseason. Like it, it, it pretty much generally works out that way, where if you can win, you know, 95, 96 baseball games, you're going to make the playoffs. And that's where the Orioles are right now if they can, you know, stay ahead of things and, and even just finish 500. But there's been some times where they've looked kind of below a 500 team, right? And that made me think, could there be help out there? Could there be help on the way for the Orioles? And let's start with the pitching side. Because over the last week or so, things have started to crack a little bit in the bullpen. Yenye Cano, who, shout out to him, did retire all four batters he faced on Sunday. But he's been a little bit shaky at times. Bautista has been amazing. But, you know, Brian Baker hasn't been as reliable despite throwing a good inning over the weekend. And Danny Coulomb was sick for a bit. and It looked a little rough, although he had back-to-back -back good outings on Saturday and Sunday this weekend. CNL Perez just continues to... Really, really struggle. We saw him on Friday allow two runs and record just one out. Orioles tried to go to Reed Garrett in the bullpen. That didn't work out. Three runs on five hits in an inning and two-thirds Friday before being DFA'd. And they added Spencer Watkins to the roster for Saturday and Sunday, although he didn't pitch. You got Austin Voth on the injured list at the moment. Keegan Akins had a couple of scoreless outings, but generally I don't really trust him at this point. You know, even pitching, starting pitching-wise, Cole Irvin... I didn't love that Friday start. He gave up three homers, four innings, three runs, five hits. You need more length from Cole Irvin than four innings and three solo homers. So there's still questions about this bullpen, especially in middle relief. And, and even Mike Bauman. You know, Bauman allowed two earned runs on Friday. Now, he escaped on Sunday, but he could have easily allowed two earned runs if Cano just gave up one hit after he hit two batters in that seventh inning. So there's not a lot of guys that Brandon Hyde feels like he can rely on right now before he gets that game over to Bautista, who's as good as ever. I mean, easy one, two, three inning on Sunday. So the question is, who can come help? Well, the first guys you're going to look to, obviously, are Dylan Tate and Michael Gibbons, both who have struggled with injuries all year. Gibbons has only thrown in three games. Tate hasn't pitched yet this year. Both of them are back on rehab assignments in AAA. Dylan Tate looked better on his rehab assignment last week. Michael Givens looked solid when he pitched for the Tides over the weekend. Now, Brandon Hyde did say that probably neither of them would be activated for this two-game series in Tampa this week. But maybe, maybe when they get back home to face Seattle this weekend, it could be a possibility. And listen, Michael Givens didn't look great in the three games he pitched. And I'm still worried about Dylan Tate's health. But, but at this point, you know, Givens is the veteran guy you brought in in free agency. And Tate has just been so good and so consistent for you over the last three years or so. Just feel like this bullpen could really use at least one of those guys pitching at a solidly high level. It doesn't have to be elite. It doesn't have to be an eighth inning guy just to be solid in the sixth inning. This team could use one of those guys right now. But I worry about relying on those guys. And this is something I've said time and time again on the podcast this year. If they're healthy, I'm fine relying on Dylan Tate and Michael Givens. But nothing I've seen from either of them in 2023 has told me that they're fully healthy and they're going to be reliable. I am still very worried about both of them making any kind of significant impact for the Orioles this year. So because of that, unless the O's are going to trade for some relief pitching, which they could, it can generally be cheap, especially with rental guys. And you can go out and kind of find some diamonds in the rough. I've talked about maybe trying to go get Carlos Hernandez from the Royals a couple of times. But if you're just looking in-house for now, they tried to do this with Reed Garrett. Reed Garrett was having a really good year in AAA, had a 1.59 ERA. The Orioles said, let's try it. You know, fastball splitter guy. He threw a scoreless inning last week, but then came out there Friday and just didn't have it, kind of had to wear it, and he gets optioned and then DFA'd. Orioles hoping they get to hang on to him, but we will see. Other than that, you do have some options in AAA. And, and first of all, you got some guys who have pitched for you before, like Nick Vespi is down there. He's been up on the roster a couple times this season, but Orioles haven't used him yet. 2-1-1 ERA in 21 in the third innings, 22 Ks and five walks in AAA Norfolk. Now, the hit on Vespi is, and, and we did see him a good amount in the big leagues last year. He only throws about 90 miles an hour. It is a cut fastball, so it's got some movement, but it's hard to be a reliable, consistent, effective reliever in Major League Baseball in 2023 when you only throw 90. That's just the reality of the situation. No matter how good he is in AAA, that's always going to be his reality. Not saying he can't have success, just saying it's going to put him behind the eight ball. 
Other guys like Logan Gillespie, we've seen him in the majors multiple times this year. He was on the opening day roster. He was good early in the year, then struggled, was sent down, has a 3-5 ERA in 18 innings in AAA, 19 Ks to 7 walks. The walks have been an issue. I think his stuff is still there. The Orioles still believe in his stuff. That's why he's still on the 40-man roster. But we'll see. I don't know if he's like a reliable guy you want to turn to. Joey Crable's still there. You know, 3-8-6 ERA, 16 in the third innings, 15 Ks, 8 walks. Kind of seemed like at the end of last year and then during spring training this year, Crable was just kind of cooked, but he's still around for the Orioles. He's still an option. I thought D.L. Hall was going to be more of an option. They did the whole deloading thing. Four, five, seven ERA, 41 in the third innings. He's got 52 Ks, 26 walks. Was only pitching about three or four innings per start over the last few weeks. But then we get the news over the weekend that the Orioles have sent Hall down to Sarasota to essentially in a bunch of weird words say that he needs to go work out more. Now, what did happen to D.L. Hall this offseason is because he had that back issue throughout the offseason, the doctors told him, hey, don't lift weights. It's going to mess with your back. Hall has said that he relies a lot on his strength and his weightlifting to get that velocity, that fastball up to 96, 97, 98 and beyond. And he's been 93, 94 this year because although he got back healthy pitching wise, he said he spent most of his time throwing instead of lifting. So the Orioles are covering this and saying that they want to just send him to Sarasota so he can just lift and throw a little bit and get that velocity back. Now, I hope that means he'll do that for a few weeks and then return to the Major League bullpen. But I have an inkling that there's maybe an injury popping back up because why would they be sending him to to AAA to lift more? They could just skip starts in Norfolk and have him lift more in between starts. You don't have to send him to Sarasota, Florida to lift weights. There's got to be something else going on there. Hopefully he can get back healthy because I do think the O's can rely on him as a bullpen arm this season, but you can't do it right now with this situation. So other than that, you got a couple other names who you haven't used in the big leagues yet. One is Darwin's and Hernandez, who's pitched in the bigs with the Red Sox before. 3-6-6 ERA, 19 and two-thirds innings. 26 strikeouts is good, but he's always struggled with the walks and he has 15 walks. That's not as good. We'll see if the O's could maybe do a Yenye Cano situation with him because he has great stuff from the left side. Then there's Edward Bizzardo, also a former Boston Red Sox. 296 ERA in 27 innings in AAA, 32 Ks to 10 walks. I'd take that. I think you could see him maybe somewhat soon for the Orioles. And then the other guy is probably Chris Valamont being used more as a starter this year in AAA, but 4.7 ERA in 53 innings, 60 Ks to 28 walks. I like his stuff as well. Could be an option. Just a lot of options down there. I don't know if any of them will turn into like a reliable guy for the Orioles, but there are options. And I just think at least one or two moves has to be made. Now, Spencer Watkins being in the bigs, that's probably not for long. I would rather have a more reliable relief type. So you probably option Watkins and bring somebody else up. And then I do think we're getting pretty close to seeing up Perez DFA time. I know it's going to be tough because of how good he was last year and how good the stuff can be. We might be getting pretty close to that, and we could see Nick Vespi for a little bit until D.L. Hall is ready to go, or maybe even Darwin's and Hernandez to add another left to the pen. And with Watkins down, I mean, I could see him going back to Gillespie, but maybe Edward Pizzardo. I I could see maybe getting a shot here in that bullpen. But it's not just the bullpen. I mean, the bullpen's been really good still throughout the year. It's been a strength for the Orioles. The offense has been a strength too, but... There's just some guys tearing the cover off the ball in AAA, and and it's got to be about time, right, to get into the big leagues. Kowser, Westberg, is it time? We'll talk about that next to finish off the pod. So the Orioles' offense has, has still been solid this year, right? They still had 14 hits on Sunday as they win the game 6-3 to three to avoid the sweep. But you got to think some different guys could be here. And I, I was talking about roster moves earlier in the weekend. You know, Spencer Watkins coming up with Reed Garrett eventually getting DFA'd. Spencer Watkins, you know, he's he was solid last year. I don't see the O's using him a lot unless it's kind of mop-up duty. We'll see if he can even stick around for now, you know, with the Orioles on the roster. They got Austin Both on the injured list as well, making some moves there. They also had to put James McCann on the injured list this week. He sprained his ankle, leaves sliding into the base on Saturday and, Brandon Hyde said he hopes it's just going to be the 10 days for James McCann, but the O's had to go with a new backup catcher on Sunday. Jose Godoy was activated. Godoy, who the Orioles brought in on waivers a couple of weeks ago, 
He's been in the big leagues with the Mariners, the Pirates, and the Twins over the last two seasons, last three seasons, really. Only has 62 major league plate appearances, though, and just a 123 big league hitter. More of a defense first guy. However, you know, six for 21 with a homer in Norfolk since the Orioles got him off waivers. Listen, Godoy's not going to play much. The Orioles have an off day Monday and an off day Thursday this week, which means most likely Godoy will not play until Sunday. And then after Sunday, you would get McCann back before the next time you would need to, you know, fully have Adley DH or sit. So we could only see Jose Godoy start one game. That's probably going to be Sunday against the Seattle Mariners, one of his old teams. So the off days this week really help with having your backup catcher out. We're going to see a lot of Adley. But that's not really the moves I want to talk about here. It's more about, first of all, just Colton Kowser and Jordan Westberg being this good in AAA, right? Like Colton Kowser, over 1,000 OPS, eight home runs. Jordan Westberg, 953 OPS, 17 homers. Jordan Westberg's had almost 700 plate appearances in AAA. Kowser's had much less, but he's still been dominating since he came back from the injury. It's got to be time here, right? And the Orioles could have some different reinforcements coming in soon. Like Ryan Mountcastle is eligible pretty soon here to be activated off the injured list after he was put on there before Tuesday's game with Vertigo. You know, that's coming up late in this week. He could be back and he started to swing a little bit and hit off the tee and he's making progress on coming back. Yes, I know he was struggling, but he's going to be activated the roster. He still hit lefties well. He's still a guy who's going to help you. Cedric Mullins is down in Sarasota right now, starting some light baseball activities. Hopefully by July, he's back in the order. That's going to be a huge plus for the O's. And, you know, they didn't even have Gunnar Henderson on Sunday, who got scratched from the lineup late with a little bit of stomach bug. Hopefully with the off day Monday, he can be back Tuesday. But that's a mini reinforcement there. Didn't have him Sunday, still won. But there's still got to be some guys who can be better. Because you look at the big league roster, like Jorge Mateo, yeah, he's gotten a couple more hits recently, but... I'm just not loving the approach of the play. It's still tough to watch. Joey Ortiz has been a little rough. I would still like to see him play more, but he's been a little rough. Not saying send him down, but maybe a little back up there. Ramon Arias has had a weird reverse splits year where he just can't hit lefties. So even though he's a right-handed hitter, he's hitting 315 against righties, hitting 197 against lefties. So you kind of only rather play him against righties right now. I mean, Ryan McKenna did come off the bench and get a hit on Sunday, but he was one for his last 22 before that. He's not really playing much at all at this point. Not really sure why he's on the roster. Aaron Hicks is filling in just fine for Cedric Mullins in center field. And then you got Josh Lester, who hasn't really hit too much, had a rough weekend. I talked about that just bad effort play that that he wasn't able to make on the pop-up by the dugout in the fourth inning on Sunday. I just don't really see why Josh Lester's here anymore. I got why they called him up. You know, more power than Taron Vavra still has some versatility, but just don't love it there. So Vavra is one of the guys you could bring back up if you think he could help your offense a little bit more. Maybe he could. But it does feel like the Kowser or Westberg time is coming, right? I mean, moves you could make right now. Lester and McKenna could both go down to AAA. Kowser and Westberg could come up. Westberg can play some third. He can play a little outfield. He can DH for you. He can be another right-handed bat who can play those, maybe those McKenna starts that he gets against left-handed pitching. And then, you know, you call up Westbury, you got another shortstop option besides Henderson and Mateo and Ortiz. If Mateo and Ortiz don't have the bat there, we can still keep them on the team because they provide value. And with Kowser here, you have an outfield option with McKenna going down. You have a left-handed bat option with Lester going down. And you can play them in the outfield in a situation like Sunday. You can move O'Hearn to first. Kowser goes to the outfield if something happens to Gunnar Henderson. Cows are going to play some center field, play some corner outfield. You can get these guys in the lineup. Now I get it's going to be even tougher soon because Cowser, you know, if he hasn't been up for this long, Mullen's going to be back soon. How many at-bats can he get? Mount Castle's going to be back soon. How many at-bats can Westberg get? I, I get it. I understand the argument. Like, you don't want him to sit on the bench in the big leagues. But I think at this point, call them up and see what they got, right? They can provide a spark into the lineup defensively, offensively, that's going to help this team. And I think you have easy moves there to make with Lester and McKenna. Shouldn't be too, too difficult to make those moves right now. And maybe they want to wait till Mount Castle gets back to see what he looks like post-Vertigo. Maybe the swing changes, and that's fine. You can still use Kowser. Left-handed bat, not Josh Lester, can play the outfield, not Ryan McKenna. At the very least, I think it's got to be Colton Kowser time. But there's reinforcements there. Pitching, hitting, they are there. It's not like... The O's are in dire need. They're still playing great baseball overall, but it's been a little shaky recently. They could use some help 
it's there in AAA if they want to pull that trigger. If Mike Elias wants to pull the trigger, hasn't really wanted to yet. Maybe this week, maybe this could be the time we see one of those guys get to the big leagues. But hey, the O's are still playing. All things considered, good baseball. Yes, they did lose the series, but 44 and 27, you win the Sunday game. You're still feeling good. You got a big series coming up against Tampa. Just a two game series, but you can gain some ground in the division. But first, they get a nice day off here on Monday as they travel to the Trop. That'll pretty much do it for today's episode, except for we've got a bobblehead to give away here. The Cedric Mullins 30 30 bobblehead, giving it away to honor this podcast getting to 3,000 subscribers. That is thanks to all of you, the everydayers, the first listens on audio, on YouTube, everything. Thank you so much for just making the Locked on Orioles podcast what it is. And I get a chance to give away some cool stuff like the Cedric Mullins 30 30 bobblehead. So I got over 200 entries into the contest commenting about their favorite player from the rebuild who's no longer here, but, you know, Holds a special place in an Orioles fan's heart. Did a random drawing of all the entries that I got and have come up with the one winner of the Cedric Mullins bobblehead. The YouTube commenter who wins the bobblehead is Brannock something. That is the name on YouTube, Brannock or Brannock something, who commented that Cesar Valdez and the Dead Fish was their favorite player from the rebuild that's no longer here, writing, one guy I really loved watching back in 2020 was Cesar Valdez. His dead fish changeup was so fun to watch. It was great seeing the Orioles with a somewhat reliable closer for a short stretch in 2020. That is the truth. So again, Brannock something, congratulations. You have won the Cedric Mullins 30-30 bobblehead. Make sure, if you are listening or viewing, to send an email to LockedOnOrioles at gmail.com or Send a message via Twitter at Locked on Orioles, and I will get you your bobblehead. I will also comment. I will reply to your comment on YouTube. So make sure to check the comment section. Again, Brannock something, the winner of the bobblehead. Congratulations. And again, if you are not a subscriber to Locked on Orioles on YouTube yet, go ahead and do that because we're already gaining towards 4,000 subscribers. And when we get there, we'll give away another cool piece of Orioles memorabilia. But I'll be back on the podcast tomorrow after the off day on Monday. Might open the mailbag for the Tuesday episode. Send your questions in, LockedOnOrioles at gmail.com. Tweet them at LockedOnOrioles or leave them right here in the YouTube comments. and I'll get to them on tomorrow's mailbag episode. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.